Welcome again to part 13 of our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. And as I mentioned earlier, this is Palm Sunday, but we want to continue in our look at the Corinthians. We're going to follow through. Again, next week will be a special service with Easter, and we'll step away from our 1 Corinthians series for next week. But we just wanted to acknowledge that and let you know we've been going through this journey. Paul wrote the letter to Corinth to address issues that were happening in the church. He had started that church. It was a church to a Gentile people, to people that were not Jews. And they had a lot of different influences. There was multi, there were multiple gods that were worshipped. Uh, philosophy was a big deal. Debate. Those were all huge parts of the Corinthian culture. It was very much a, an urban center where there was wealth and industry and all of the stuff that goes along with that. And so there were these people that were becoming Christians. They were forming a church and they came from all different walks of life. And and people that did not have a common bond in any other way now had one in Christianity. And they found themselves in a church. So you had wealthy with poor and just average citizens all mixed together. And there was conflict. You had conflict in the beginning with who they were going to follow. Some said they followed Paul. Some said they followed Apollos. And and Paul kind of talked about that, hey, we're all on the same team here. This isn't about any one leader being better than another. And then they found out that there were people in the church that were boasting or talking about how great they were as communicators and how they were better than Paul or anyone else because they could communicate well. They could give a great presentation. And Paul said, look, man, that's not about what what this is about. And he said, actually, the Holy Spirit told me to speak in very common and plain terms with you so that you would know that it was only through the power of God that you came to him. So we had all of these things, and then we found out there was sexual immorality going on, that they were even boasting about some of that stuff, that there were people suing one another within the church. All of this culture, all of these different things were were happening, and, and... People were visiting temple prostitutes, and there was all kinds of stuff just happening. And so Paul wrote the letter to kind of correct some things and to give some doctrine and to lay a groundwork or a foundation for the church to build on. Remember, he started the church, and his ministry that God gave him was start churches, get them established, hand them off, and go start more churches, which is what he was doing. He had been gone for a year and a half, two years by the time he wrote this. So Chapter 8, which is where we're at, it's part 13, but chapter 8 is no exception. We're going to look at another area that the church struggled in that Paul's trying to correct. Now, if you would, read with me the first, uh, well, actually, there's only 13 verses in chapter 8. So if we'll read chapter 8 together, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. I titled this message, Knowledge versus Love. Verse 1, now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and that there is only one God. There may be so-called gods, both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords, but for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we all live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as worship of real gods. And their weak consciousness are violated. It is true we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it. And we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others of weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience 
by eating food that has been offered to an idol? Because of your superior knowledge, a weaker believer from whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Now I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, how does this apply to me? This doesn't relate to our culture. We don't generally here in America have people offering sacrifices to other gods and then serving them to people and selling them. I'm sure it may happen somewhere, but generally in culture as a whole, I can't, I can't say that I've ever been offered food that I knew was offered to an idol. I can't say that I've ever went somewhere that that was the case, and I think that's probably similar to most of you. So you might be thinking, man, this is one passage of Scripture. Why did we even bother? This doesn't relate to us in any way. But listen, even if you don't struggle with that, There are things and principles in this culture that relate to us in this passage today. I can think of it in several areas. And so we're going to kind of address those areas. And the first thing that we're going to address is love is more important than knowledge. Let's say that again. Love is more important than knowledge. Now, unless you've missed it, we live in in an information age, which I think all of you know. We have cell phones, we have computers, we have information in abundance at our fingertips in a moment. We've all said, hey, just Google it. Or you might use Siri or Alexa just to go and and talk and say, hey, Siri, tell me this. And, And they'll bring it up just like that. So we have all of this information right at our fingertips. We have more knowledge than we know what to do with. So it's it's crazy, but there are a couple lot of a couple problems with this. First thing is this: not all the information you find on the internet is true or complete. Sometimes you can look some things up, and it will be information that is incomplete and you, and you start to tell people about it and then you find out later, well, I wasn't even close. And we speak to it as if we know for sure. And so there are reliable sources and then there are unreliable sources. And, and so it creates confusion. It creates a false sense of knowledge and people debate and argue or share misinformation all the time. You think about it. You could watch one commercial that will tell you that this is the way you should eat, this is how you should eat, this is how you'll be healthy, and then 10 minutes later you'll get another commercial telling you exactly the opposite thing, that is how you should eat and how you should be healthy. And so there's a lot of confusion with all of our information. And as Paul says, and I don't know if you caught the, uh, the sarcasm there, it's even in quotes in scripture, superior knowledge. So that's kind of one thing. And the second thing is this, and I think this is even more important, is that knowledge, uh, the same thing is knowledge without wisdom is dangerous. Let me say that again. Knowledge without wisdom is dangerous. Think about that for a second. Let that sink in. You could have all of this knowledge, but if you don't have the wisdom on how to use it, sometimes that knowledge can be misused can be used to harm others, can be used to confuse others. So knowledge without wisdom is very dangerous. And that's kind of where Paul is addressing these things. He's, he's, people are struggling with all this stuff, and this happens to be food offered to idols. Um, Look again at verses 1 through 3, and he's answering a question. We actually get that in there. Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, We know that we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. I love that line. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So knowledge makes us feel important. We we feel like we've got the answers. Have you ever noticed that, especially around 
somebody that's maybe a little bit more immature and and they love to just share all of the knowledge that they have and they will argue to the death over it. They know it. They know all about it. They've got all the answers. Well, Paul's saying, even in scripture, says people that tend to be like that really don't know much. They don't have an understanding because when you have all of this knowledge, you have the wisdom and how to use it, the wisdom and when to speak and when not to speak and to understand how all of that works. Some people use knowledge to look down on other people, to treat them poorly, to make fun of them. And that's a misuse of knowledge. Knowledge without love tears people down. Maybe you've experienced that in your own life. Maybe you've had somebody that just made you feel like you were the biggest idiot in the world because of their superior knowledge and they use it to tear you down and make you feel inferior. That happens. Maybe you've been on the other side of that coin. Maybe you've been the one, and you probably won't want to admit it, but maybe you've been the one that have, has just tore somebody apart because of your knowledge, what you knew, and, and how you had to be right. That's a big deal. Some of us don't know the difference between how to share what we know and love and to just being right. Some people think being right is all that matters at the expense of somebody else's feelings or relationship. And that's where it becomes really dangerous. Some of us love to tell everybody because it puffs us up. The problem is we can hurt people and, or we can lose our own credibility. I can remember, we call them campfire stories, where you have people that, man, you, you, they just share these stories of all these great and amazing things that they've done and know, and, and they just puff themselves up. And everybody around the, the campfire, is what we called it, would just know that probably 90% of what they say is not true. It could not have happened, but yet they share it as if it was to make themselves feel better, to make themselves look better. Many of us have knowledge, but we don't have wisdom to use it properly. James 3.17 says this, But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. The wisdom from above knows exactly how to use that knowledge with love and gentleness and peace. See, there's a difference in taking the knowledge that you have and guiding somebody and mentoring them and, and leading them and helping them to understand, or there's that side where you just make yourself look better and make them feel inferior. We all know we've all seen those things. When we love someone else, we're more concerned about building them up than being right. Not that we want to give them false information, but look, we want to encourage them, strengthen them so we can speak that right information into their life. Not just shove it down their throat and tell them how great we are and how much we know, but love them and communicate with them so that they will have the respect of us to learn from us. We have to be careful how we use our knowledge. So here's the next thing, because our knowledge, again, without wisdom, can hurt people. The second thing is this, don't let your freedom become a stumbling block. Don't let your freedom become a stumbling block. And you're going to see how this works in just a minute. And this, again, is using your knowledge with wisdom. So I want to give you a little background on this situation that Paul is addressing here. Again, we don't really have the, the issue of eating food offered to idols. But in that culture, remember I said they were a cultural center. There were a lot of different temples and a lot of different idols that were worshipped, and there would be sacrifices that happened in those temples to those false gods. There would be meat and things sacrificed, and if you know anything about the sacrifice, not all of the meat is, is burned up, and actually even in the Jewish culture, when, there, when the sacrificial system happened, that's actually how they fed the priests. The fat and things would burn off, and they would take a giant fork and pull out, and that was the priest's portion of the meat once it was, was burned up, 
or cooked basically is what it was. And so they would take the meat offered to sacrifices and they would often have take it to the markets to sell it. Or they even had kind of restaurants in the temples where you could come in and eat. I don't know how it worked. I, you know, I, I can only envision that. Never experienced anything like that. So people were buying food sacrificed idols and eating it and they were doing that. And then some people who really had it, they, they couldn't reconcile that because they were, they didn't want to dishonor God by eating something that was offered to this other God. And they remember, they thought of a very polytheistic society, which means multiple gods. And they were struggling with the idea of one God, even though they, they loved Jesus and they loved what he did for him. They still struggled with that. They had a wrestling match with it. And so it was making people stumble and becoming a stumbling block because some people in their freedom, like, hey, God, there's only one God. And this other stuff doesn't matter, so I can eat that meat and it doesn't mean a thing to me. But it was causing other people to stumble. So Paul addresses these things and these stumbling blocks. First, he starts out with, and this, this sub point in the notes, if you have them, is there is only one God. If you look at verses four through six, he says, so what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and that there is only one God. There are many so-called gods, both in heaven and on earth. And some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. It's really one God, three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I know the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned here, but that's it. Paul is driving on the point that there is only one real God. He doesn't want there to be any confusion. He wants everyone to be clear. There is one God. And he acknowledges that many people serve other gods. Other gods in Scripture were often demons, principalities. And so that's where many people had a problem eating the food. And... Some people did not because of our freedom in Christ. We have freedom in Christ. Even in, in, in Peter, God lowered down all these animals and said, kill and eat, because for the Jews, they couldn't eat pig. They couldn't eat any but any or certain meats. And God's saying, look, you have freedom. You can eat any of this. Because of me, this does not, it's not an issue. But for some, they struggled. So here's the second thing is when your freedom becomes a sin. And yes, your freedom can become a sin in your life when you misuse it. Remember, many of the people believed that eating that food or, or meat that was sacrificed to idols was sinning against God. So here's how sin crept in. It was an attitude. It was an attitude about their freedom and basically mocking or looking down at the others that, that would, would not eat that meat and treating them differently or eating that meat and causing them to stumble. Look at verses 7 through 12 again. It says, however, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weaker believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. Paul brings this back around. Knowledge without love hurts others. Yes, you could eat food sacrificed to idols and it would not affect your relationship with God. But it could cause another believer to stumble. And because of that, it becomes sin. 
That brings us to the age-old question or debate, am I responsible for others' actions? Think about this. Am I responsible for other actions? This has been a question that's been asked for a long time, and I think the answer is yes and no. So it really depends on the situation. On one hand, everyone has to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling and to come to those places. But we are responsible for how we influence others. Yes, they have to work out their own salvation, but we are responsible for how we influence others. So can you think of some examples of how that might be relevant today? Now, for those of you, you know, you're watching online, and and if you're watching this live, I know some of you will watch it later on YouTube, and obviously you can't do that. But for those of you that are watching live, type in some ideas of how that might be relevant today. Take a second and just type in some ideas. Let us know how you think that might be relevant today. What are some examples of how that might work? I'm going to give you one really quick that I think is an easy one to understand. For years, there's been a debate in Christian circles about alcohol. I can remember as a kid, man, drinking alcohol was a sin. You couldn't do it. It was the worst thing in the world. And it was put right up there it, it, and put it that, man, if you drank alcohol, you were far away from God. Well, here's the truth of the matter. When you look through Scripture, you cannot find anything anywhere other than like Nazarite vows in specific situations like that where it said to abstain completely from alcohol. I'm going to be careful on this because I want you to understand it and you got to hear me clearly. Taking a drink of alcohol is not a sin anywhere in Scripture. Drunkenness is. Being a drunkard is. There's also the stewardship issue as well, I think, being a good steward of our finances. And when you look at alcoholic drinks, man, I'll go different places and you see the menu and you see one drink's like 6 to $12. And you're like, whoa, man, you're spending hundreds and thousands of dollars. We've, we've been on vacations, on cruise ships and things where I've seen families drop thousands of dollars just on drinks. To me, that's a stewardship issue. But here's the deal. That's a whole side thing. If I walk into a restaurant as a believer and even as a pastor, and I were to sit down and order a beer with my meal, and the person sitting next to me, or maybe even somebody a couple tables over that knew who I was in the community, saw me drinking that beer, and for them, growing up, man, taking a drink of alcohol was, was a sin. That would cause some discrepancy. Or maybe that person's an alcoholic and I didn't even know it. And it opens up the door. Well, hey, if the pastor does it, it must be okay. And it leads them down a path that leads them to alcoholism. Or restarts a path that they were down before. My freedom to drink that beer might cause that person to stumble. Therefore, my actions, according to Scripture, I'm responsible. I own some of that. That's a difficult thing to work out. Because your freedom, you don't ever want to cause somebody else in your freedom to stumble. I've seen that happen. I've seen people that have come in that never drank because of of where they stood on Christianity and they they had a Christian friend that did drink and all of a sudden that person starts to drink and they can't handle it and drunkenness becomes a part of their lives and I've seen it happen on multiple occasions. So it can become a stumbling block. This isn't about whether alcohol is good or bad or can I drink or can't drink, but you have to use wisdom. That's why for the Assemblies of God, the the fellowship that we're a part of, they ask us as pastors to abstain from alcohol to not create confusion or to cause somebody to stumble. It makes sense. So I don't drink. Even though I have the freedom to drink, I choose not to and to come under the authority of my fellowship to not drink, not because 
we want to tell people and put rules and restrictions, but because we don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else. We don't want to cause somebody else to sin. My freedom could cause somebody to sin. Use some wisdom. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Look at Paul gives us a great solution in verse 13. He says, So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. And I think this is where many people think Christianity gets really restricting. And it's not. Really, we have a lot of freedom. But we want to help people come to relationship with God. And I think if we speak about it with intelligence and, and we don't lord over people, like t- take the old drinking thing. People are like, oh, I don't drink. I don't do that kind of stuff. And we act like we're superior in our superior knowledge that we don't do those things because we're better than them. That's not it at all. Look, I choose not to drink for multiple reasons. One, because as a pastor, I don't want to be a stumbling block. And I've told people, hey, look, I realize that I deal with people. I kind of hold myself to this standard because I don't want to cause somebody that struggles with alcohol to stumble. I don't want to be a stumbling block. That's because I love people. I love people. So you got to, it's a heart issue. Is what I want, I want you to hear this, think about this for a minute, is what I want personally more important than the salvation and and eternity of the people around me? Is what I want more important than the eternity or salvation of the people around me? There are things I could do in my freedom, but I choose not to do them because I don't want to be a stumbling block. This is something we really have to wrestle with. This is something where as we get closer to God and we understand the Holy Spirit, we can understand where our freedoms lie and how we can best love the people around us. I choose to love others and meet them where they're at rather than let my freedom become a stumbling block in our relationship and in their relationship with God. So here's a question for today. Where are you at? Are you more concerned about what you might lose or being right than you are about how you're impacting the people around you by your actions? Let me say that again. Are you more concerned about what you might lose or being right than you are about the, how your actions might affect the people that are around you. That's a hard issue. That's something you have to wrestle with God about because I'm going to tell you, if you're so wrapped up in your own freedom that you don't care about the people around you, or if you're so wrapped up in being right that you don't care about how the way you're responding affects the people around you, then you're walking in sin. Because our freedom, and this is our takeaway for today, our freedom is not more important than loving others. And I'm going to point you back to our core foundation verse in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. It says, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. I think we all understand that. The second is equally important, equally important, by the way, Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means treat them with love and respect. That you're going to do everything in your power to show them that God loves them and that you love them. And that you're going to be conscious of who they are so that you can build that relationship and lead them to Christ. Are you wrestling with some of these things today? Are you wrestling with where you stand in your freedom and and your relationship with God? That's something to pray about. 
ask God to give you wisdom because again, knowledge without wisdom is dangerous. It hurts people. We don't need to let our freedom push people away. We don't need to let our arrogance push people away. Jesus had all the freedom in the world, yet he loved the prostitutes and the tax collectors and those around him. And all he ever said to them was this, go and sin no more. They knew by being in his presence that what they were doing wasn't right. He didn't have to preach to him about it. He didn't have to tell him how superior he was. They intuitively, through the Spirit, knew. He said, go and sin no more. Love people where they are and draw them to a relationship with God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we celebrate you today. Lord, give us wisdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we know how to respond, so that we know how to interact with the people that are around us. We don't want to be a stumbling block. It's so difficult because we do have freedom. We do. You want us to have that freedom and that joy. But Lord, help us to have the wisdom to not let that freedom become an issue for the people that are around us. And Lord, I pray that you would be with each one that's watching today, that they would be full of your spirit, they'd be full of your wisdom. And Lord, if there are some that need to have a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you would help them to draw in close, to understand that you love them right where they're at today. Give them the strength to give everything in their life over to you, to trust in you for that peace. And Lord, we celebrate you. We thank you again for uh, Palm Sunday and all that you did this last week of your life leading up to Easter. And Lord, we celebrate all of that. We love you and we thank you for all that you're doing in and through us, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us today and celebrating with us. Next week is Easter. We're doing something completely different. If you can be with us in person next week, this is a great week to do it. We'd love to see your smiling face and, and join in with us for our Easter celebration. Again, have a great week and we'll see you next time.